Okay, today's, uh, today's year is in memory of uh, Dr. Charles Feldman, Chuck Feldman, who was uh, actually a good friend of mine. He was also one of my doctors. He was all of us, very fine person. The former husband of Rella Feldman, the staunch Trisha attendee and supporter. So. Neshama should have an aliyah. Okay, let us begin. We are in the last chapter of Shmuel, chapter 24. And uh, I wanted to continue where we left off. And maybe at the end I'll say a few words about the Megillah. And, uh, okay, so the story is that the last chapter is the story in which uh, uh, King David, David, takes the census of the people. Uh, the story, again, in, that we have in chapter 24 of Shmuel, Bet, the last chapter, as we know it, is also is a parallel story in the book of Dere Hayomim. In Chronicles, chapter 21, First Chronicles, there's a parallel story as well. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to look at the two stories and compare and contrast the two stories. In any event, so the story is that David takes the census. His, his general, Yoav, tries to dissuade him, to discourage him from taking the census. What do you need it for? But David insists on doing it. The census is brought back to David, and after he, he gets the numbers, which is in chapter 24, um, Verse number uh, nine, he uh, in verse ten he's very contrite. Vayachlev David Oto, he's very upset, and he turns to God. He says, "I sinned. I sinned grievously. Chatati Maod, forgive my sin. Kineskalti. I've been very foolish." The word that we focused in on was the word Maod, sinned greatly, grievously. And David gets up the next morning in verse 11 on page 702. <coughs> and the word of God came to God Hanavi, Jose David, David's prophet. So apparently David in his court has more than one prophet. We are familiar earlier with Natan Hanavi. God Hanavi also appeared earlier in the book. And here it's God that sent to David. And he gives David three choices. And you are to choose, you can choose one of the three. The three choices being... Uh, Famine for seven years, a war, running away from your adversary, Nusrol of Neitzarecha, for three months. And finally, the last choice on the top of page 703 three days of plague. Shloshet Yamim Deve. You should consider and, you know, know what message, message should, I, should I send back to the one who sent me. So, you, your choice. And David refuses to choose. David does eliminate one of the three possibilities, namely the middle one, running from your enemy, which I presume to be not personally running from the enemy alone, he's the king of Israel, means being pursued by an adversary. That David removes off the table, for he says in verse number 14, I don't want to fall into the hands of the human being, Sarli Ma'od playing off the choice of Nuschalif Neit Sarecha, running from your adversary, that he eliminates. But I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in God's hands, he says. And the response in verse 15 is, Vayitain Hashem Dever Be Yisrael, Me'aboke Aviyad Eit Moed. So the response, I'm just repeating what we saw last time, the response is plague, Dever. From the morning until the set time, we at eight 70,000 die. That's as far as we got last time. We noticed last time that the language around the punishment of Dever is parallel to the language of the Torah when it comes to the plague of Dever, which is the fifth plague, in, in several senses. First of all, there's a play on the word Dever and the word Davar which is equally true in the Chumash, when the pl fifth plague of Dever is Dever and then twice Davar. There's a play on Dever and Davar in both cases. In each case, in the Chumash, in the fifth plague of Dever, and over here, it's talked about happening at an appointed time, eight mo eight, that we have in both instances. And finally, 
that when it comes to the plague of Dever, it's the one and only plague <coughs> where the Torah speaks about God's hand, Yad Hashem. He said, Yad Hashem, or Yavim Miknecha Basodeh, etc. Dever Koved Ma'od. And over here, the emphasis is on the hand of God. So the plague of Dever, which in the Chumash is the plague against Pharaoh, whose heart is hardened, who refuses to concede, is the same plague leveled against the people and against David, their king, uh, who also is hardened, in other words, who refuses to listen to the one who says, don't do it, and it's actually the same language, Vayechezak. Vayechezak Tvar HaMelech Yoav in verse number 4 is the same language as Vayechazek Hashem, Vayechezak Leif Paro, etc. The point being, the larger point being that it's not really just about Paro, but any king who actually who sees himself as, as doing, as, as one might say, superseding God or replacing God, or equivalent to God, which is what the taking of the census is about, because the taking of the census is a way of saying, these are my people. In the Chumash, you count the census through, through, uh, through the Mishkan. The Machsid HaShekel is we are a people by virtue of the fact that, we, are, that we, we, we serve the same God. That's the definition in the book of Exodus of what constitutes the people. But in this chapter, in chapter 24, in the last chapter of the book as we know it, David counts the people for no reason. There's no reason to count the people. There's no war. There's no reason except to assert his power after two rebellions. So that's what's problematic about, and David realizes this right away, I have sinned grievously. And I, we talked last time about how this particular sin, though it appears very trivial from one perspective, from the, um, from the conceptual perspective is, 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 the, is the deep sin of the Book of Shmuel. Because the issue in the book of Shmuel is kingship. Who is the king? Shmuel says, well, God is the king. And the king is, no, for that reason, it's, it's heresy. But God doesn't seem to be opposed necessarily to the king. And that is because the king could, in theory, reflect God's values. That was Hannah's prayer in the beginning of the book. God should give strength to God's king, who will carry out God's values. So in the last chapter over here, we have the issue raised once again, which is why it's the last chapter, about kingship. Is kingship a possibility? Or is kingship by its very nature a, uh, a, a, a supplanting of God? Yes, Alan, what do you mind? We see frequently uh, the number 40 um, as a sign of kingship. Um, as a generic for a large <coughs> 40 yes. days of right. blood, 40 days on Har Sinai, 40 yes. years. Do we have a similar, is there some significance to the number 70,000? Well, the number 70 is very significant. First of all, the number 70 appears in many contexts. I can mention it's got several. Seven in it. What? It's got seven. It's got seven, but it's also 70. 70 is, there are 70 nations in the world. There actually are 70 nations. Kasuto points out when you look at Genesis, you can actually count 70 nations. There are 70 souls who go down to Egypt, which is the parallel to the 70 nations. And there are the 70 years of exile that Jeremiah talks about 70 years of exile. You return after 70 years. So the number 70 carries with it a significance. Now, if you ask me, what exactly does 70 represent, apart from the world, maybe? The world or Israel as a world, um, maybe other things. 40 years is a generation. 40 years is, that's clear. Uh, but 70 is a significant number in the Bible. Yes, what do you want to say? Uh, what I'm trying to figure is how it's justified for the people to suffer in such a way for the king's sin, that 70,000 people... Right, so I, that's what I would... Fine. So I try to address that. I'll repeat, that's a very good question. My point about the last chapter, which begins with the words, and God's anger continued to rage against Israel, by Yosef af Hashem l'acharot Israel, and Rashi says, lo yadati alma, I don't know why, says Rashi. So I claimed that maybe I do know why, in the sense, the following sense, it, especially if it's the last chapter. See, this is the big issue that the many people think, well, this is a little four-chapter sort of little in, piece that they threw in at the end. It's not really the last chapter. Fackelman, in his massive work, analyzes these four chapters in a different part of the book. He doesn't analyze it as the end of the book. 
So to me, that's actually chutzpah, but that's beside the point. It's also wrong, because it's certainly the end of the book. And if it is the end of the book, endings are very significant. And the claim that I made last time is that, which is the basis of everything that's, from that we move forward, is that the last chapter of the book goes back, after all the stories with David and Bathsheba and Amnon and, and, and Tamar and Avshalom, and it's an unbelievable narrative, that you forget, actually, what the book's about. So the last chapter of the book goes back to the core issue. What about kingship? And we have to remember that as much as David wants to be king, and as much as he's very manipulative throughout the book, and a flawed person and all that, at the end of the day, the request for kingship, which was framed uh, inappropriately, give us a king like the other nations, was not about David. It's the people. So the last chapter, the anger of God against the people, goes back to the fact that the people said, we want a king like all the nations, which the Chumash says, as far as I read it, that's not, you can't have a king, you can have a king, but it can't be like all the nations. The king you can have, and the only king you can have, is one, that God chooses, and two, a person who understands that the role of the king is to represent the people. So my point about this chapter, lost on just about everybody else, but my point about the chapter is that in this chapter, it goes back to the essential question of the book. But what about kingship? And, yes, David wants to be king and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, the request for kingship, as Samuel said very nicely, when he thinks that Saul is wrong, your sin was l'sha'ol l'chem melech. Sha'ol means the one who was requested. So now we go back to this question. But what about kingship? So God is still angry because God's angry at the very initial request. God says to Samuel, don't take it personally, says God. It's not about you. They've been doing this to me for hundreds of years. You know what I mean? They haven't rejected you, they rejected me. The question is, they rejected me because of the way they frame it? Or is the very kingship itself a rejection of God? That's the core question in the book. And the last chapter answers that question, I think. Answer. The way they asked is, was wrong. But the kingship, per se, is not necessarily wrong. You can have a king who is a perfect reflection of God's will. And that king, actually, in this chapter, is David. Because David, in this chapter, recognizes and expresses completely what it means to be the perfect king. And I said, furthermore... <laughs> that the book of Samuel in general, this is the last chapter of the book, but the very first chapter of the book has Hannah, one of the true heroines of the book. She's pretty clean, Hannah, from, and you can't say that about virtually anybody else in this book. Um, she says it straight out after she has her child, and she hopes that the world can change, that this child will change the world, which he does. And she ends it by saying, talks about the God who cares about the marginalized, the God who will fight against the wicked and the arrogant, etc. And then she says, and God should give strength to God's king. And by that she means, I assume, that we should have a, a leadership that understands God's will and tries to implement God's will in this world. That's the way the book begins. And my point is this chapter, which is the last chapter, and which carries all kinds of literary connections to the beginning of the book, this is the question of the book. What about kingship? And here we have David sinning, and... And David is given a choice in the first part of the chapter. You choose, says God, but you choose is a test. You know, the prophet says, you know, somebody sent me to speak to the king. Okay, king, tell that guy what, what you want. You know, that's, after all, you're the boss. You're, you're the leader of the people. Why don't you tell the guy that sent me what you want? So David, no, 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 no. I'm in God's hands. I eliminate the human possibility. I mean, God, will, God will choose, I'm not choosing. So the response is, okay, you, you, you've passed the first part of the test. You understand what the Chumash says. Hashem The king is the one that God chooses. So David does very well by eliminating only the middle possibility, but leaving the choice up to God, fine. So now, the punishment, which is not primarily against David. David sees David as at fault, but, but the, in, the, in truth, the people are being punished. And then we have the following. So we have Dever. Now we know, actually, that in the Chumash, the punishment for counting the people is Dever. Because the Torah says, Shabbos Shkolim, Pasha Shkolim. Don't count the people. Count them only via the Mishkan. 
Lo yebahem negef bifkod otam, lest there be a negef. Magefa usually is, is plague. So we, we actually know what it is. We know, but David won't say it, because only God can choose it. We know, we know that the, the, the davar has to be dalad bet reish dever, but David doesn't choose it. So God sends a plague, as God, by yishlach yado, see again the word yad in verse, by yitel Hashem dever, 70,000 die. Now verse 16, we're up to verse 16. So the angel, in biblical Hebrew, means to harm. We have it, by the way, in the very beginning of the Chumash. The beginning of the Chumash. The reason the human being is banished from the Garden of Eden. God says why. God said, In chapter 3, Behold, the human has become like one of us, to know good and evil. Viata pen yishlach yado. Lest he literally stretch out his hand, let it be his take inappropriately. Viachal gam eitzah chayim, by vlokach gam eitzah chayim, viachal vachay liolam. Lest the human being be sholeach yad, shlichut yad appears many places, negative typically. By the way, it appears many times in the in the Megillah and Esther. Right? I was sholeach yado by Yehudim. So it's a phrase that appears many times in the uh, Megillah, actually. It means to harm. Sometimes it means to attempt to harm. Sometimes it means to harm. But it's always that kind of thing. So over here, we have that the angel, the angel extended his hand, means to damage, to harm, to destroy, against Jerusalem to destroy it. But God re- re- relented, God relented, or renounced further evil, El Hara'a. God says to the angels, enough, hold back your hand. And the angel of God was in the threshing place of Aravna the Yavusi. By the way, I just noticed something here. I've told this story many times. I've written about it both in my Haggadah and my Megillah. I talk about the story over here. and There's plenty more to say. Just noticed something new I never saw before. I must have read this story a hundred times. That's the following. The language over here of Vayinachim. God relented of the evil. Now, we remember in the book of Shmuel, this is the last chapter of the book, that the word Vayinachem figures very prominently in one of the key stories in the book of Shmuel. And the story I'm referring to, and a very timely one for us today as well, is the story of Amalek. In the story of Amalek, Saul, King Saul, Saf Torah, Parsha Zachar, King Saul was commanded to destroy Amalek and failed to, to he, did, he did kill Amalek, but he didn't kill, take, kill the king, and he didn't kill the best, he took, they took the best animals for themselves. So the prophet Shmuel goes to Shaul and, and condemns him, and Shaul gives his excuses. Well, the people did it, we did it to sacrifice, etc. And then Shmuel says to him, listen, God has takes the kingship away from you. You're not going to be the king anymore. And the eternal of God, Netzach Yisrael, lo yishaker v'lo yinachem. Ki lo adam hu lehinachem. The eternal of God will not change God's mind. God is not the human being who changes his mind. Lo adam hu lehinachem. Now that, that statement, God is not a human who changes his mind, is of course taken from the Chumash, it's what Bilaam said to Balak in the second prophecy, right? Second prophecy. Um, what's the second prophecy of Bilaam? Loish Elvi Chazevu Ben Adam V'Yitnecham. Right? God is so the, the the Shmuel chapter fifteen of Shmuel plays off the Bilaam story in many ways, but what's striking about chapter fifteen, of course, the first word, the first words of the Haftorah. And God said to Samuel, Nichamti, I've changed my mind. <laughs> and the last words of chapter 15, of course, 
Vashem Nicham Ki Emuichet Shaul. So it turns out, and that's very interesting, that God actually does change God's mind. And in fact, we have it in the Chumash, at least on two places that are rather significant. First, we have it in... Right, right, Vayinachem, exactly. That's the second place that we have it, exactly. That's in the Golden Calf story, Vayinachem Hashem. And the first place you have it is the beginning of the Chumash. God creates the world, Vayinachem Hashem ki asa'at adam ba'aretz. And God re- regretted the fact that God cre- had created the human and decides to destroy the world, the story of the flood, the story of the Mabul, the story of Noah. So to say that God doesn't change God's mind is certainly untrue. What Bill meant by it, we can't get into that now. But the fact of the matter is that God does change God's mind. And my, I never noticed this before in all the years. So here you have it. right? So I'm thinking to myself the following thought, which is this. I don't know what to make of it exactly, but chapter 15, God will not change God's mind in the story of Saul. And you know why God doesn't change God's mind in chapter 15? Because Saul can change Saul's mind. The point of chapter 15 of Amalek is the sin of Saul. Okay, he took what he shouldn't take. That's true, like the Garden of Eden. But the real problem is that when confronted with it, he says, no, I did, no, I, I did nothing wrong. The people did it, not me, I'm, I'm, I'm good. When the people did it, you know, the king, the sacrifice. So the, point, the whole point of chapter 15 is that what does him in, actually, is the inability to say, I did the wrong thing. But in our chapter, exactly the opposite. David turns to God and, and says to God, <coughs> you choose. So he's already on the course. He's already on the course of, of, of repentance. So God responds to the person in these two episodes. It's sort of like a mirror. When the person is a certain way, then the response is, is, is similar. I'll give you an, 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 one second. I'll give you a, a good analog to this. An analog to this. Um, it's the story of Jacob wrestling, with, wrestling with, the, with, the, with this mysterious person or angel or whatever it is. It's called an ish in the story. But Jacob says, the, the, the person blesses Jacob, you have, re- you have wrestled with the human and the divine and you have prevailed. Now in that story, the point is that when, the, when the, this, what's called a messenger of God, when the messenger confronts Jacob and, and wrestles with Jacob and fights with Jacob, it takes place at a time before Jacob crosses over into the land. Everybody else crosses over, and Jacob is left alone. And Jacob wants to cross over to the other side to possess the land, but he can't cross over. And the reason he can't cross over, presumably, is because he's Jacob, he's Yaakov. And Yaakov, in the story, carries with it all kinds of significance. He's the one who's holding on to his brothers. Let's start with the fact that Yaakov is related to the word Akev, a heel. And the heel, in the book of Genesis, reminds us only of one thing, the snake. And in point of fact, he is very snake-like because <coughs> what does the snake, what, what is the snake's MO, basically? How does the snake operate? Goes after why? Why does it go after the heel? Goes after weakness, vulnerability. Exactly, exactly. Well, exactly. But it's the place of vulnerability. The snake talks to the woman, not to the man, actually, because the woman was never commanded not to eat of the. The snake attacks you at your at your weak point. So that's that's what Yaakov does. Yes, of course. Achilles' heel. You have the, you have the. It's, it's cross cultural, but in the Chumash. And that's what Yaakov did. Yaakov manages to get the birthright from Esav when Esav is tired. He comes back very tired. Who are Yef? He takes advantage. Give me the soup, only if you sell me the birthright. So he, and then the blessing, he takes advantage of his father's weakness. His father's blind. His father can't see. He takes advantage of that. So he's a snake, basically. And his name is Yaakov. And we, when, these, when this messenger of God confronts Yaakov, he is out to destroy him. And in fact, it's very interesting. How does he try to destroy him? What, is the, what words does the Chumash use? Vayeovek ishimo adalot hashacha. Vayeovek. Vayeovek is to, to wrestle in modern Hebrew. 
But vaye avek, as the Ramban explains, is related to the word avak. What is avak? Avak is afar. That's the snake. Dust. The snake it lives. The snake lives in the dust. Afar tochal ko yemeichayecha, which is big death. The snake is living death. So Jacob, in that story, is confronted by somebody who vaye avek. The someone who confronts you is actually your mirror. That's the way it's. But then Jacob wrestles. Then Jacob fights. Only send me, no, I'm not saying to, to, I demand a, a direct blessing, not a blessing that I take from somebody else. And then suddenly, this messenger becomes a different person. The messenger becomes the one who, who, who actually gives blessings. You're not Jacob anymore. Well, what's the blessing? You're not Jacob. You're not, you're not the Akev anymore. You're Yisrael. You have, you have confronted, you've wrestled with the divine, etc. And you were wounded in the process, but in, in the struggle. But you become a different person. So now the messenger is a reflection of, 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 who, of who Israel now is. So that the blessing is a reflection of actually who you are. The blessing is the best part of yourself. That, that's the blessing. That's my understanding of the confrontation with the Ish. And that I'm wondering about over here in our little word, Vayinachim. God is, God is relenting, God is regretting because, because David regrets. Since David regrets, then God is the mirror of David. Not too bad, huh? Wonderful. Pretty good. And here's the interesting thing. This is a story. Uh, here's a story that I think I actually know pretty well. It's about uh, Wald Shmuel. This is my favorite chapter. It's the last chapter, and I've said many wonderful things about it. And we tell you a little secret. The more you understand something, the more you realize you don't understand. <laughs> That's the truth of it. Because <laughs> you realize there's so much more there. This is the word. I just noticed it now. This is, the, this is the power of this kind of learning, actually. So it, it's, about, it's about reading. And suddenly you realize, boy, this is very interesting. I never realized that in my life a hundred times. Never noticed it. Anyway, that's the reflection, that's the mirror. Claudia functions as a mirror. In any event, now we come to a different interesting question. What do we make of the fact? So God says to the angel, to the malach hamashchit, the destroying angel, I mentioned last time we met that destroy malacha mashchit is a term that we find in the in the Passover story, where God sends the destroying angel Pesach, right? Um, to the destroying angel of Passover is called the mashchit because this is all related to David and Pharaoh, etc. So as we mentioned before, in any event, so the God says to the angel, "Stop! Hold back your hand." But the next verse. Says, David saw the angel smiting the people in verse 17. Behold, I have sinned, I have strayed. What have the people done? God, let your hand be directed against me and my father's house. By that, David means. Hand directed against me and my father's house. Father's house means me and my, my entire house. It means my dynasty, my kingship. So if, if, if my being the king is causing the people to die, I have to step down. I have to step down. Because the leader is there to do what's best for the people. I'm not going to stubbornly stay in office because of my own ego and let the country go to pot, right? <laughs> Nothing to do with current events at all, but, this is, but, but the, fact, the fact of the matter is that, uh, so that's what David says. But the question is, and I saw Falkelman ask this question, but it already says in the previous verse that God had told the angel to stop. Does this mean that David actually is, that what it's about is David's misunderstanding of the situation? Is that the point? Or is there a different point? What is the point of God saying in the previous verse, stop, but then David, in the very next verse, who sees the angel killing people, saying to God, if it's, uh, instead, of, instead of directing your anger against them, direct it against me. If, in fact, we've been told in the previous verse that God already said to the angel to stop. So Fackelman takes it, it's, it's, it's that David is, is, is wrong-headed and David is mistaken. So I'll tell you what I think. I think that's not right. Because I don't think the tone of the story is that. I don't think this, this chapter is about David's errors. I think it's about David's greatness, actually. So why is that previous verse there, actually? I don't think it's there to say, but David doesn't get it and makes a mistake. 
I don't think that's what it's about at all. I think it's about something else. The place that the, the angel hovers above a certain place. The place is Goren Aravna. Now, Goren Aravna, Aravna is the Yivusi, because Yivus, is, Jerusalem is the one place, the last place that was captured in the conquest of the land. David captured Yivus in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. But in this story over here, he's not going to capture anything by force. He's going to purchase. Just as we have in the Chumash that both Abraham and Jacob purchase. They buy. Jake, Jacob purchases something right outside Shechem. And Abraham purchases the gravesite for his wife Sarah and then for himself and his descendants. So I think it's a different point over here. Our, going to Aravna, in the word Aravna, we have the word Aron which is the place of the ark. This is actually the place of God's permanent residence. This is going to be the place of the temple. The book of Samuel doesn't spell that out. The book of Chronicles says explicitly, this is Mount Moriah. But the book of Samuel, which has the, the work of the great artist, doesn't bother with subtlety is very important. But it's clear. This is the permanent place of God's residence, which will become the place of David's kingship. And the point, I think, that the book wants to make over here is that the place that becomes the place of God's uh, sacred presence is the place in which God said to the angel, stop the killing. That the idea of the Mishkan, the idea of the Mikdash, is the place which, which allows for, uh, for uh, forgiveness. That, and that's, of course, that's the Yom Kippur ritual that basically the forgiveness comes through, through the Mishkan. And that basically is Milgram's point in his massive work on, on Vayikra. He says many things, but the point is, his point is that every Yom Kippur, we have to purify the temple. That the purification right of the high priest is primarily purifying the temple. The temple is the vehicle through which we achieve forgiveness, but the temple can become degraded through people's sins, both in the temple and outside. So every year, apart from the scapegoat sacrifice that carries our sins away, the temple itself has to be purified because the temple itself becomes the place of, of, of forgiveness. And that idea, I think, is what the book is after over here. By having um, not only David confess, which is very important because through the confession <coughs> he retains his kingship, but also to emphasize that this particular place, which is the place of the Aron, Doran Aravna, is the place that God has already said. It could even be that the next verse is actually prior to the previous verse. It's not clear. David, when David was seeing it, maybe he saw beforehand. But it's not about the contradiction between the two. It's about the duality of the place. That the place of the temple is both the place which allows us to be forgiven, but it's the place from which forgiveness uh, uh, emerges. And that's, I think, the point of the previous verse. Yes, my friend. Perhaps having uh, asked God to play in mean, these meetings, and then maybe choice two was a bad choice. Choice three was a bad choice. Maybe choice two. Oh, he didn't choose. God, God made the choice. He just eliminated choice two. Exactly, but that, but, 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 but in a sense, and he says, I mean, the third choice is is, is to bring on play. True, and which I'm, is of course the obvious choice because that's what the, that's what the Chumash actually says is going to happen. It's not that he's actually, we, we, the reader knows already from the beginning what, what the punishment will be, because the Chumash said it. But my point is, I'm not going to make that choice. And I could also say that once you turn to God and say, you choose, it's up to you, then God could choose whatever God wishes to choose. The main point being, I'm not choosing. I'm, 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 we, I'm, I'm, I am in God's hands. That's what he said. I'm beyond Hashem. That, that's his point. So I think that, now, there is something else over here. And I want to get back to, this is a sort of follow-up from last time. Now let me get back to a very important point about verse number 16. Verse number 16, God said to the, God said to the destroying angel, Rav, enough, heref yodecha, hold back your hand. So the, the angel is about to destroy, and God says to the angel, hold back your hand. When you read God saying to the one about to destroy or kill, hold back your hand, I think all of us immediately think about the binding of Isaac. Okay, that is exactly the story. You have over there, and you have the same language. Um, what, what does it say with Avram? Avram was, yes, 
Av is about to slaughter Isaac. Al tishlach yodcha el anar. There you have shri chudyad. Al tishlach yodcha el anar. And over here you have vayishlach yodo hamalach hushachata. So that's another literary link between the two of them. So there are two, two questions. The first question is, is this a literary link well, fi- well founded? Or it's just, it's a literary, you know, it's an illusion here, a bit of an illusion, but it's not central to the story. That's the first question. And if it is central to the story, the second question is, what is the point? Now, finding links between stories is very nice, and people do that all the time. But the question is, what is its significance? Is it truly significant or not? Before I get to what I believe to be the case, that it is truly significant, and appropriate for the last chapter in a very deep way, I wanted to make two other points about the link between the two stories. One is that in over here, when David says, what have these people done? What David is saying is, instead of killing them, destroy me and my father's house. By that he means my dynasty. That the house of David should be Beit David. That David's dynasty is called a Bayit in the book of Shuel. I'm going to build for you a Bayit. And David turns to God and says, thank you very much for the Bayit, but I, 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 I'm going to forgo the Bayit. Then what David is saying, in effect, is there'll, 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 there'll be no future house. Which, of course, is exactly the story of the binding of Isaac. What Abraham is being asked to do in the binding, or commanded to do in the binding of Isaac, is to give up his future. Because if he sacrifices Isaac, and Yishmael is already gone, there's nobody left. So therefore, Abraham has no future. So what David is being uh, requested, what asked to do over here, is to, uh, is to, what David is willing to do over here, is to give up the future, just as Abraham is willing to give up the future. And in each case, Dafka, because of that, there's a blessing. In the case of the Akedah, Abraham is told that he will now bring a sac- you know, that because you did this, you have, a, you, have, you have the eternal blessing, you have a covenantal blessing. Um, and uh, in the case of David as well, once David says that, God says to David, go and bring a sacrifice in the place of Aravna. And then the, 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 the plague will stop. And the sense is that David's kingship has been, has been, has been secured. So it's not just secured in each case uh, at the time when the person is actually willing to, uh, to uh, forego, to, 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 give, to give up the future. Second point, which is clearly a strong support, I, I think the strongest support, that the two stories are linked, is what comes next. In the book of Shmuel, in chapter 24, after the prophet comes to David and says in verse number eight, 18, Aleha came Lashem Mizbeach, <coughs> Begorin Aravna Ayvusi, bring up a build an altar in the place of uh, in, in the place in the threshing floor of Aravna, and David does that. David goes, and this, as the story continues, David comes up to build the mizbeach to bring the sacrifice to stop the plague, and when Aravna sees him, he asks David, "Why have you come?" That's in verse number uh, twenty-one. Why have you come? Uh, David says, well, I came to build, them is to build an altar, to build the Mizbeach, and to stop the plague. Verse 22, So Aravna says, you should take, take whatever, you, the king should take whatever he wants. You can take the uh, oxen for a burnt offering. And for the, and for the wood, the threshing boards, the gear of the oxen for wood. In other words, what is, what is, what is Aravna saying to David? You don't, have to, you don't have to come and buy it. David said, I come to purchase it, right? Yeah. David said in verse, um, with note, in verse number 21, I came to buy the materials for the sacrifice. Says Aravna, what buy? Take it for nothing. I'll give it to you. It's a gift from me. Take it as a gift, O king. And David it says, Hakol Natan Aravna. Aravna gave everything to, to, to David. Doesn't mean he gave it. It means this good is given. Doesn't, he doesn't give it. David says he, he offers it to him. Natan. He means to offer. Actually, I would say Natan has the meaning here 
that it has in Megillah Esther. I'll just digress for one second. In the, in the Megillah, if you remember, when Haman goes to the king, chapter 3, and Haman says, right, the king says to Haman, I'm, I'm going to bring in 10,000 kikar kesef, I get a trillion dollars or something like that. So the king says to Haman, hakesef notun rach. The money is natun for you. What does that mean? So some interpret, the king says, forget the money. Don't bother with the money. It's not too, and it's not, forget it. The money is yours. I give it to you. That's one possibility. In my opinion, that's not right. There's no sense in the Megillah, quite the opposite. When Mordechai sends a message to Esther in chapter 4, he tells her about the money. The money was not, the king was not mocha the money. So what does not too mean? Natun does not, in Megillah, Natun doesn't mean to give. Natun means to permit. The king gave the Jews to stand and protect themselves. He's permitted. So, Akesef Natun means something different. I permit you, he says, to bring money to the treasury. The point of it being, of course, that Haman's idea is not just to gather the money to kill the Jews, but Haman's idea is to collect money for the treasury, and that money will be used to kill the Jews. And in doing so, he makes Achashverosh a full partner. That's one of the key points of the Megillah. That's one of the difficulties. It's not just Haman. <coughs> the point is, the checks say Achashverosh treasury, treasury of Achashverosh. That, that's the point. He co-ops Achashverosh, which is the last verse of chapter 3. Which is not just about, it's Rabbi Salavet should emphasize the complete lack of concern, people being, that's true. But that's not the main point. The main point and the difficulty that the Jews will have is that the king is a partner. You are, they're eating together. When you eat together, that's a partnership. So the money is being paid out by the treasury. That's the that's notun. Over here, it's the same thing. Akol notan aravna hamelech doesn't didn't give him anything because David says I don't want it. But he says if he gave it, he is, he he permits him to take it. Take it, he says. It's yours. Take it. I I permit. Right? Doesn't mean notan. Doesn't mean notan yet. And he says, and God should bless you. Says David, no. I'm going to buy it. I want to buy it. I don't want it for nothing. I don't want to bring sacrifices chinam. And David, vayiken, and David buys it. What, what is the story this is related to? Right. B'nei chet. It's the purchase of the, of the grave for Sarah. Marat, the purchase of the land. Right? What, is, what, what, what does Ephron say to, to Abraham? Take it, he says. I can't, right? Hasoden notati lach. Notati, I gave you. It's exactly what. Hasoden notati lach. Vamarash abaluchon notatiya. I'll give you the give you the, the field. I'll give you I'll give you the, 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 the cave, right? Take it. Go ahead. What does Abraham say? Listen to me, he says. Right? I'm not taking it for nothing. I insist on paying. Tell me your price. Of course, Ephron is is a character. <laughs> says Ephron. Okay, you know. It's about uh, $722 million for the grave in the field. So much? Yeah, the field, the, 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 gra the grave which he wants to buy, he doesn't ask for a field. The grave is $2,000. But he, the, it was the package deal. You gotta buy the, gotta buy the field too. That's $722 million or so, you know. Says Abraham, no problem. Abra meo shekel kesef ovel asochia, 400 is the great number in Genesis. Whatever you want, he doesn't care because he wants to have that place. So that's the story. Now, the story of the purchase of the gravesite for Sarah, for the Jewish people. Where does that story appear? The binding of Isaac is chapter 22. Chapter 23 is the purchase of the gravesite. So the two stories are together. You see straight up that the, that the book of Shmuel is playing off those stories. You see the Akedah is here. So you have to understand the significance. Now, let me say two other points about this. I find them extremely interesting. There's actually a difference between the two stories. So well, just, just one second, just one second. There's a difference between the two stories. And the difference is the following. That in the story of the, of the binding of Isaac, it is true that the two narrative stories that appear one after the next are, are the binding of Isaac and the purchase of the, of, the, of, the, of the gravesite and the field. That's true. Over here as well, there's the 
allusion to the Akedah, followed by the purchase. But there's an interesting difference between them, which I will, if we have a chance, I'll try to hypothesize what it's about. In the first instance, there's the binding of Isaac, but it's not immediately followed by the purchase of the grave. In between the two of them, there is, there is Abraham hears, after these things, <coughs> that Milcah, his, bro his brother's uh, wife, has given birth to a whole bunch of children. One of them is actually Rebecca. But there's a whole bunch of them that are, then, after this, after the, after these 12 names, <laughs> then you have the story. So in a sense, in the Chumash, the purchase of the grave and the Akedah are separated by a genealogy. That is not true over here. Now let me just make another point related to this, which is also interesting, which is the following. You have two stories back to back, in the, let's say in the Chumash you have the narrative of the Akedah, the purchase of Sarah's grave. What is the next story in the Chumash? The, the Akedah is chapter 22, the purchase of the grave is 23, what is 24? 24, right, the servant. 24 begins with the words, Be Abraham Zakain Baba Yamim. Abraham was old, old in age, and God blessed him with everything. And he calls his servant in. And he says to his servant, You've got to find a wife for my son Isaac. And there's a discussion of the servant discusses, maybe she won't want to come. Then the whole longest chapter in Genesis is how the servant goes out and secures a wife for Isaac. The wife is Rebecca. And once Rebecca is secured by, marries Isaac, even before she marries him, whatever marriage takes place, it's clear that at that point in time, Isaac has replaced Abraham as the patriarch. Because when they come back, he sees him, he sees him, Rebecca sees this man walking in the field. <coughs> Who is that man? This is my master, Adoni. Up to that point, Abraham's the master. So th the next story is about succession. Isaac taking the place of Abraham, Rebecca taking the place of Sarah. It begins with the words, Avraham Zakain Babayamim. Now, how does the next story appear in our book? David is cold and old. David Zakain Babayamim. And when you look at that chapter, which, by the way, is the Haftorah for Chayisara, the next chapter, there are loads of parallels between the two stories. That will be a whole, at least one shear, if not two. So you see something very interesting. Many years ago when I saw this, I was so excited about this, you can't imagine. And I've said many things about these chapters. It's almost as if whoever wrote this, I assume the author of the first two chapters of Kings, whom the academics think is the, is, that's the end of the book. And they're not wrong about that in a certain sense. They're correct in a certain way about it. They don't actually un understand why they're even correct about it, but, 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 I'll, but I'll explain that if we get a chance today. They're not wrong about it, but it's clearly the same author. And the fact of the matter is, I believe that whoever wrote this, no one knows who wrote it, has the Chumash open. And you have three consecutive stories. You have the Akedah, you have the purchase of the gravesite, and you have this story of succession with the, with the main person being old, or very old. And in each of those, and these the stories in, in, uh, in our book are parallel. But what's interesting is, and I don't know when this happened, I just don't know, but the way we have it in front of us the third story, which is the succession story, is a different book. So there are two interesting distinctions, because that's in Kings. Yeah. Now, I do believe it's the end of Samuel. I think they're right about that in a certain way, but we'll get to that. But what's interesting is that the two differences between the three consecutive stories. First difference is that story one and story two in Genesis are separated by a genealogy, not here. And the second difference is that even though narratively the next story follows immediately, but for whatever reason, our tradition, if it is our tradition, I assume it is, has placed the third story in a different book. What is that about? But, uh, these are the things I like to explain if we get a chance. What, what time is it now, by the way? Um, Quarter to 11? 30, 40, 40 minutes, fine. Okay, I did want to say two words about the McGill at the end, but okay, fine. Um, in any event, so let's get back to the first... Let's get back to the, so in other words, the point being that, let's get back to, all of this suggests to us that the, that the reference to the Akedah is not something which is totally incidental. That the Akedah story actually is 
significant over here <coughs> that the writer of this, whoever it is, who writes this story in this chapter, which is the last chapter, has the Akedah in mind. So I wanted to uh, tell you what I believe is the significance of that. Begin with that, and then many of the details, if we have a chance to explain them, either this time or next week, I don't know. But he, do you want to say something, Sarah? What do you want to say? Yes, agreed. I agree that the, there is a, that, that was my point. That that in the question, there are three choices. You tell me which one you want. It's a kind of test. The word Nisayon is not mentioned over here. Yes, Ruth, what do you want to say? Um, are we supposed to be contrasting the story of what happens here with Rabbi Matefa and his offering of his dynasty with what happens in Merak Olive, where the people are suffering and the, and the antidote to that is actually cutting off the rest of Shaul's succession? Well, the antidote actually in chapter 21 to the, to the uh, famine is identical to chapter 24, and actually the same language. But if you look at chapter 24, you'll see that the word, the key word at the end is vayeoter in 21. Is that correct? Chapter 21, verse number, verse 14, the last verse. Vayeoter Elohim aretz acharechein. And then only afterwards, vayeoter, and the, at the end of chapter 24, vayeoter Hashem aretz. So in each case, there's the sin of a king. My point was that in 21, it's a sin of Saul, but it's not really about Saul. It's about Saul, yes. It's equally about David. And in 21, it's about how do you stay or stop the famine. But in 24, the second story, where God continues to be angry, it's about not just stopping the, the plague, but through the story and through David's confession which doesn't exist. In, in 21, Saul never confesses. That's for sure. Saul doesn't confess. David is the one, if it is a confession at all, or an understanding, if not a confession, it's David's understanding. Okay, he sees Ritzim about Ayo, etc. But in 24, it's about confession. And David's confession allows by, by Yehotar, in this case, to be not just that the plague is stopped, but that actually the permanent place of David's kingship has been secured. That's the point. Just as in the Chumash, when Abraham purchases the, the grave for Sarah, it's not actually about the grave for Sarah. But let me make that point clear. The story of purchase of Sarah's grave has nothing to do with Sarah's grave. He's offered the grave for nothing. He's offered the grave for nothing. He doesn't want a grave, actually. When you look at the Chumash, he does want a grave, but he doesn't want a kever. He's offered a kever for zero. He doesn't want a kever. He makes it clear three times in the story, a different word, a chuzat kever, a, a, a permanent possession in the land. The significance of that story is that Abraham is purchasing the land. That becomes the, that becomes the essential purchase in the book of Genesis. That's why before Jacob is dying, take me back to that place, the place that Abraham bought, he says. He emphasizes that. So it's not about burying his wife. They say, wherever you want. You're a prince of a man. Nobody will not give you a, a place to bury your wife. That's very nice, he says. They put me in touch with Ephraim, and I want to have an Achuzat Kever. He figures somehow that Ephraim is, can be bought for a price. Whether he knew the extent of the price, I don't know. But he wants, he wants to buy it. He doesn't want to be given a gift. Same thing with David over here. He doesn't want it for nothing. He wants it to be a place that... I'm not bringing sacrifices for nothing. There's got to be a sacrifice in buying the place for the sacrifice. That's what David said. He insists on buying it. So that's a parallel. Now let me get to the main point I want to make about this one. He's buying it to establish the temple on that spot, that the future, this will be the future center. He's not given the permission to build the temple. True. But he is able to make the first sacrifice on the temple site. That's a good point. That that's true. Right. That is 100% true. He doesn't actually build the temple in, in our books yeah, over but here, he, he but he acquires, the, he acquires the place of the temple. That's actually a very important point, of which a lot could be said, but thank you for that formulation. That's correct. He actually, David actually, it's called the Temple of David in many places, right? Because David, even though he didn't build the temple, yeah, but the place of the temple, Beis HaBechira, the chosen place, is David's, is David's doing. It's not, yes,
that. Yes. Could it hark back to a, a, a tear? Yes. A yes, it certainly uh, could. So, but, so it's used twice in that one verse. Yes, it is. Vayet ta Yitzchak lo Hashem enoch hachishto vayet otelo Hashem. So basically, it's a brilliant use of the word. It turns, it gerunds it from a noun to a verb to an adverb. It's, what it's saying is that in the same exact manner that Isaac prays so wholeheartedly for his wife to have a child, God in the same millisecond Using the same verb, right. gives him his heart's desire, <coughs> and so this this giving you what you want, and the harking back to the Isaac story and God and listening, um, is it related to Vayet Ater Hashem here in chapter four twenty four? I you know I thought about this for a long time, and I'm sure there is a connection. I never was able to formulate precisely the Vayet Ater is I think the two significant this two. Two stories in the Torah that Vayetta relates to. The main one it relates to, I think, is Pharaoh. Because the word Vayetta appears in Pharaoh eight times. Hatiru Badi. But in the case of Pharaoh, even though he says, I sinned, I sinned, pray for me, he always changes his mind. And David's not that way. David actually confesses. David means it when he says, Get rid of me. And David brings the sacrifice, and therefore God responds. So that's one thing. But I happen to agree with you. I haven't thought it, I've thought about it plenty, but I, it strikes me that the Isaac story is significant because you have the double, as you say, that God, it's what I sort of said before, that God responds to the person where the person is. If you put yourself in a certain place, God will respond. Yes, when you want to say, Shmuel. Have you, have you addressed um, God's continuing to be, uh, to be, to be angry with you? I addressed it before you walked in the room. <laughs> yes, just a very, that's a very important point, yes. Can't go over it again, but yes, I did speak to it, and fine. Now, let's get back to the, yes, Alan. Two quick things. Isn't the more obvious reason God can't forgive Saul is because the sin itself was the sin of Amalek, and you know God is very sensitive about that. Yes. Right. So how is he going to forgive that, as opposed to the other issue? That you said, which was so You know something? I don't get that sense. It's a matter of I can't prove one way or the other. I don't get a sense that God could not have forgiven it. I mean, the fact of the matter is. I mean, the choosing of the crime, you know. <coughs> it's not that right. Sparing the crime. No, I understand. It was an Amalek way to do things. I totally agree. But that's not the sense that I have. The sense that I have, that, that story actually plays off Gan Eden in many ways. It's the same sense I have in the Gan Eden story there was an opportunity to make it right. Um, you know, I think when it comes to forgiveness, God is a, God is a forgiving God. The Bathsheba story, although David pays an enormous price for the Bathsheba story, he doesn't lose the kingship. That's a pretty bad crime. It's, you know, it's, it's the adultery, the murder, and the cover-up, which is, you know, and it's using the kingship in every which way to cover up the crime. The person, the commander-in-chief of the army uses the opposing army to kill his best soldier. You know, I mean, that's... So there's... I, my view is that God is essentially a, a, a forgiving God. And remember, it's not that Saul just didn't carry the Amalek story. As it says at the end of chapter 14, Vayas chayel, vayachet Amalek. He, he does defeat Amalek. Mm-hmm. He kills the people. He, okay, like in every war, people take stuff or whatever it is, you know. You know, you call the firefighters, they come in, the heroes, they put out your fire. And you see a few things are missing afterwards. Okay, you know what I mean? Are they heroes or not heroes? Yeah, they are heroes. The heroes were human beings who sometimes take what they shouldn't take. Not all of them, of course. Sometimes it happens. And, uh, you know, that's the story of Saul. So I don't think it's Amalek would, would have been the barrier. I think the barrier is Saul doesn't understand, actually, or doesn't what it means to be, to be a king. His very excuses are, 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 are not excuses. One last thing. Yep. And why is the English translation going out of its way, all this comma, O king, footnote E, I don't see footnote E, yeah. it's right, it says O king, speaking to David, right. Aravna gives to you majesty, it is a mercha after right. Aravna, so it's Aravna Melech is the simple reading of it. Right, yes it is, right. So that's a question, some people think that's a scribal error, that Hamelach is a scribal mistake. It, I generally don't like to go down, it's possible. But Aravna is seen as an important personage. It's like in the Abraham story, whoever Ephron is, he's a known person. 
put me in touch with Ephron, right? So the Bnei Chait are, and Abraham bows down to them, etc. So he's an important personage, I think, who has, controls this piece of this territory. And the, Chum, and the Book of Shavua wants us to see that the conquest of Jerusalem was done by force. There was a war against the Yavusi in chapter 5. But there's also the purchase. And the place of the temple is not by force. The place of the temple is by purchase. And the one selling it is, the, is actually the, the true owner of the land. Maybe that's why he calls him the king. I'm not sure. But the focus here is on it's a legitimate sale. The true owner relinquishes ownership by virtue of sale. He was willing to relinquish it as a gift. Maybe he was afraid. He sees David coming with his army, you know. He's, so we, David says, no, no, it's not about that. I'll pay you whatever it costs. Um, okay, there's more to say about it. I just want to get to the maybe one point I want to get to today, which is the main point of this year, which is what actually is the connection to the Akedah? Why, why is the Akedah, why is the Akedah the story that lies behind lies behind the story of, of David. First, So I want to say something about the Akedah, which addresses the question of where this book ends. And this is the point I want to make about the Akedah. Let's forget Shmuel for a second. Future. Let's think about... There's a future in it. There's yes. future in this site being the, the, the home of God. True. That's true. That and is all true. future in the survival of Yitzhak. That is true. But that's not the whole story. That is certainly true. But there's a big story over here. Let's leave out Shmuel for a second. Let's ask ourselves a different question. The Abraham narrative, where does it end? Where's the, where's the Abraham narrative end? Where does it begin and where does it end? Now, the truth of the matter is, if you remember in the Chumash, and you have a Chumash, you can look it up and you'll see, we're first introduced to Abraham at the end of chapter 11. Chapter 11, which gives the generations from shame, Noah through shame, Terach, etc. And they get to Abraham, Avram he's called, mentions his wife, his brother, his brother's wife, etc. They set out for the land of Canaan, that's the end of chapter 11. Terach sets out. Then in chapter, Terach dies, then chapter 12, Vayomer Hashem al Avram Lechucha. And God said to Abraham, Lechucha. That's chapter 12. Now you get to the end of the story, Chapter 22, <coughs> Hashem el Avraham, Lechucha, right? Kachucha, Bidicha, Yechidcha, Vulechucha, Eretz Maria. Chapter 12 was God's first communication to Abraham. Chapter 22 is God's last communication to Abraham. And they're identical, that each, each command has the word Lechucha that appears in no other place in the Bible, just in those two places. And once you see that, you find many other parallels between chapters 12 and chapter 22. So one might say the Abraham story begins with God's first command and ends with God's last command. But the fact of the matter is that that's true. But however, we meet Abraham before chapter 12. We meet Abraham in chapter 11. And we also meet Abraham after chapter 22. Because in chapter 23, you have the buying of the grave. In chapter 24, you have the sending out of the, of the servant. In chapter 25, begins that Abraham marries another woman, Keturah, has six kids. He sends a bunch of children. He sends away uh, these children. And the death of Abraham is in chapter 25. The recorded death is in chapter 25. So where does the story begin and where does it end? You could say, well, it begins in chapter 11, and it ends later on in chapter 20, 10 to 25. You could also say, well, really the story of Abraham is that within that story, there's another story which begins in chapter 12 with the first communication and it ends in chapter 22 with the last communication. It begins with the first lechacha and it ends with the binding of Isaac. Now, in point of fact, I would say that the Abraham story has two beginnings and two endings. And here's the difference between the two endings. The ending of the binding of Isaac, actually, is a kind of ideal ending. Because as you say, in that binding of Isaac story, God says to Abraham, you have succession. You have fulfilled my word. I'm going to, all the blessings are yours. The blessings appear at the end of the story. And I'm going to bless you through your child, who is obviously Isaac, the one you have reclaimed. And because you eat, because you hearken to my voice, Ekev Asher Shabbat Bekoli, is even an allusion to the third generation, Ekev, is Yaakov. So you have there in chapter, the perfect, I would say, 
It's the perfect fulfillment of God's command. The Akedah is the perfect fulfillment of God's command. And the ensuing covenantal blessing, which confirms the earlier covenantal blessing. And you know how it's going to take place. It takes place through Isaac. However, Abraham's still alive. And the next two stories, namely the purchase of the grave and the finding of the wife for Isaac, are about something else, which is not about the blessing in some ideal terms. But they're about the actual implementation of the blessing. How do you fulfill this blessing in this world? And we are talking about this world. In the first story, he deals with Ephron. In the second story, he deals with Lavan. In each case, it's about negotiation and purchase. And in each case, the guy that he deals with is a snake. And the, Ephron is a snake, because Ephron, Ephron, Abraham says, I want to buy a grave. I want to buy a grave. I don't want a, a gift. He goes to Ephron. Ephron says, no, no, he says, my Lord, the grave is yours and the field is yours. Who mentioned the field? Who mentioned the field? What he's saying is subtext. It's a package deal. I'll give it to you for nothing, but he knows he won't take it for nothing. So if you want the grave, you buy the field. Now, the grave is at the edge of the field. So the grave is minimum, it doesn't cost much. But the field, there's a whole field with the trees and the works. You want this, mister, you buy that. Says Abraham, no problem. Arba meo shekel kesef means a fortune. 400 is a big number in Genesis. This is 400 years, Asos 400 men. It's a fortune of money. You will it? No problem. That's the first story. Second story, he loads up the camels, 10 camels. He gives the servant a blank check. Find me, find me a wife for Isaac, whatever it takes, makes no difference. Meets Lovan. So Lovan is a very shrewd guy. And after all the stuff and this and that, Lovan says at the end, you know something, maybe she'll stay around for a few days. Let her stay. No, the servant says, okay, let, let her decide she comes. The point is, in the real world, you deal with the Ephrons and the, and the Lovans. The Akedah is very pure and clean and pristine and beautiful and perfect. Then you've got to make the blessing happen. So you've got to deal in the real world. And the real world is a different kind of a world. It is true that in the story of Abraham, it's still pretty clean. Abraham comes out of that completely clean. It's a beautiful, beautiful parasha, nothing like it. It's beautiful. And Abraham comes out totally clean. He spends what he has to spend, because that's, cause that's what, what is money for anyway. You spend what you spend to secure what, what has to happen. That's the story. In the, in the Now we come to the book of Shmuel. The book of Shmuel is a story with two endings. This is what's completely lost in everybody. It's a story with two endings. The first ending, at tradition, has placed as the last chapter of Shmuel, Goran Aravna. And of course, it harks back to the beginning of the book, which is about the capture of the Ark, of the Aron. The Aron doesn't have its place until the last chapter of the book. It's in Jerusalem already, but it doesn't fully have its place yet. Because God will not stay in David's city until David comes to understand what it means to be king. Now let's get back to the binding of Isaac. What is the binding of Isaac about? So the binding of Isaac is a test. The Torah says it's a test. Elohim saw it Abraham. Everybody knows it's a test. The Chumash says so. But here's an important question about the binding of Isaac. Why this test? Why this particular test? To our astonishment, actually, it's a question that outside of me and my wife I've never seen a single person ask that question. Why is this the test? We know it's difficult, but why this particular test? Now, the point is, the Akeda. Why is this the test? And the fact of the matter is, the answer to the question is, emerges from understanding how the story works. That, in fact, it's the last chapter. It's the last communication. So presumably, the test is addressing the core issue in the Abraham narrative, of which there are two core issues in the Abraham narrative. The main issue is succession. Who is going to succeed Abraham? That you have from the beginning to the end. And in fact, the guy's name is Avram, great father. We are told he has no children. So from the very beginning, actually, you understand the question as, who shall su succeed him? First you think it's Lot. Then maybe it's, Ishmael. Then maybe it's Eliezer of Damascus, Ben Meshach Beiti. Then maybe it's Ishmael, is the obvious choice. Finally, Isaac. There are four possibilities. That is the core question in the story. And related to that question of succession has to do with finding the place. The first words out of God's mouth is go, lech lecha. And the last command is lech lecha. 
and the commands of the mill, Hitalech Lifanai, walk before me, walk, walk, walk. He's searching for the place. When will Abraham find the place, the holy, the sacred place? Because after all, the story of the the story of Abraham narrative is embedded in a different story, which is creation. We are banished from Gan Eden. What is the correct alternative to get to Gan Eden? That's the question. So, in the Akeda, Abraham accomplishes both of those simultaneously. Because when he brings the sacrifice, he both determines the place, he names the place, Hashem Yireh, the place that God has seen, which means chosen. The chosen place, and he does it at the moment he reclaims Isaac. So it's Isaac is his chosen son. But that is the question in Abraham's life. Abraham doesn't understand that, actually. He may understand it somewhere in his head, but he doesn't understand it in his gut. He doesn't understand it in his gut because it's related to a different question, which is what is the role of Sarah? He never understands till very late she is his covenantal partner. If he understood she's his covenantal partner, after chapter 17, what God said explicitly, but, your, but Sarah's going to bear you the covenantal child, if he truly understood that, how in the world, three chapters later, could he come to the land of the Philistines and say, she's my sister? And when Avimelech says, what do you mean sister? She's your wife. No, 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 she's really my sister, he says. I took her as a wife. Hello? He doesn't get it, obviously. So what has to happen is he has to come to understand how his family works. That's his challenge. And the moment he understands how his family works, he will find the sacred place. And that happens only after Yishmael is thrown out. As long as Yishmael is there, he's that, he, can't, he can't see it. But the moment Yishmael is gone, and Isaac is the one and only son, then he has, has the possibility of understanding. But the point of the Akedah is, it's not sufficient that Isaac be his son by virtue of the fact that nobody is left. Isaac has to be his son in the positive sense through a positive act of actually reclaiming Isaac, which is what Abraham does at the Akedah. And the moment he reclaims him through the sacrifice is the moment he finds the sacred place. That, my friends, in a nutshell, is the point of the Akedah. And for that alone, it was worth coming today. <laughs> Trust me on this. And now let me make the point about David. David has a similar, David wants to find the sacred place. But David has a different challenge. His challenge is not seeing how his family works. That's not his challenge. He has a different challenge. His challenge is to understand what it means to be king. And the moment he understands what it means to be king, he will find the sacred place. And in chapter 24 is when he comes to understand what it means to be king, which the Torah has set out and the book of Shul interprets the Chumash. What it means to be king is number one to understand that God chose you. That is to say you work for God. You're God's employee. And your mission, and your only mission, is to carry out God's will. As Hannah said very clearly, that's your mission. And we people forget their mission. And kings can easily forget their mission because they have so much power, which they want to retain. That's number one. And number two, your part of that mission is not just that God employs you, but you work for the people. You are the people's servant. Now, David actually expresses this in chapter 6 when he talks to Michal, but that's a story that has some negative overtones. But in chapter 24, David says something else. I know what it means to be king, and if I can't fulfill this job, I'll step aside, which is what Abraham is willing to do with the Akedah. Abraham comes to secure an eternal connection to God. He achieves a measure of immortality at the moment that he's willing to give up the future. It's Dafka he's willing to give up the future. If he, if he sacrifices Isaac, there's nobody left because Yishmael is gone. He has no future. Oblivion. He, if willingness to accept oblivion is, is what allows you in the binding of Isaac to connect eternally to God. Willing by David to give up the kingship, which he says, kill me and kill my father's house. And at that moment, God says to David, okay, now you could be king. Now rise up and bring the sacrifice in the place of the, the place where the ark belongs. Now that you understand that I'm not a king in your, I'm not a god in your city. You're a king in my city, which is the formulation. And David goes, and David pays it for the place, and the plague is stopped. That is the ideal kingship. But now you deal with the reality of kingship, and the reality of kingship is very dark. 
anybody who read the book of Shmuel understands. And the next chapter begins with a parallel to the Abraham story, but it's very different. Because the story of Abraham, Parshat Chayesorah, he's very old and he can't travel. But when you read that Parsha, which is a very beautiful Parsha, you get a sense that at every step of the way, this, this servant, this messenger he sends out is carrying out Abraham's will. Even when the messenger goes to the well and prays, to whom does he pray? He prays to the God of Abraham. It's our, it, it's, it's, this is our prayer, actually. It's how we pray. God of our ancestors, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Blessed shield of Abraham. That's how we pray. The servant is praying, God, answer Abraham, your servant. That's what the, at every step of the way, the servant, who is incredibly ingenious, because he, he figures out how to make Abraham's dreams come true, Abraham doesn't tell him how to make him come true. The servant is ingenious, actually. But the, every step of the way, you get a sense Abraham's in control. From beginning to end, Abraham's will shall be carried out. But what, what about if she doesn't want to come? Says Abraham, then forget it. The God who brought me will bring her. Abraham's there throughout the story. He's completely lucid. He's maybe too old to move. He's completely lucid, and his spirit hovers over the entire story. That's the patriarchal story. By the way, why is it that the book of Shmuel chose the Abraham story here at the end, to which the answer is, it actually chooses it in many places. This is another important insight into the book, into the book of Shmuel, which is that there's a reason it chose the Abraham story, among them being that what the Abraham story is about in the Chumash is the passing on of a blessing from generation to generation. The patriarchal narrative in Genesis is all about transmitting a blessing from one generation to the next. That's exactly what the kingship is about. Kingship, as opposed to judge, judgeship, is about some kind of eternal system where, in theory, you could pass on forever. How do you establish that? So the Abraham narrative is a very good model for the, for the model of kingship. But in chapter 1 of Kings and 2, which our tradition has placed in a different book, that's a different story. That's a dark story. Very dark. Because David is old, and what you don't know in that story, maybe we'll spend a week on that story, or, or maybe more, I don't know, but what you don't know in the first two chapters of Kings is something different. You don't know what David knows and doesn't know. It is absolutely unclear how much David knows. Everything's unclear. The prophet Nathan says to Bathsheba, after Adonia, his son, pronounces himself king, he says to Bathsheba, listen, you're in trouble here. This guy takes over, you may be in the, on the missing persons list, you and your son, you know what I mean? So you have to go to the king, and you tell the king, remember the oath that you took to me that my son shall be king. You swore to me my son shall be king. Now, of course, when you read the book of Shmuel, we find no such oath. That's not to say there wasn't an oath. Maybe there was an oath. But as we say, we learn Gemara is Maman of Shach. Either way, we got a problem. <laughs> if there was an oath, how come David isn't fulfilling it? And if there's no oath, why is the prophet reminding this old guy of an oath he never took? It's called the elder abuse, I think, or something like that, <laughs> you know what I mean? So we got a problem throughout the story. And not only that, we shouldn't forget that after Solomon becomes the king, and David never wanted him in the first place, that's pretty clear, but after he becomes the king, the first thing he does is to kill his own brother, to get rid of him, followed by under David's instruction, the killing of Yoav and the killing of Shimei, each of which is very dubious. But that's, in other words, we're talking about a, that's the way the kingship is established. As Hyman Ross said in The Godfather, this is the business that we chose. That, this, this is it. That's the way it works, you know? This is the business that we chose. And the fact is, it's not the same as the, it's parallel to the Abraham story, but it's very dark. Because the institution of the patriarchy is one thing, it's a spiritual thing. The institution of kingship, which may be absolutely necessary and has a very good side to it potentially, but has very many dark possibilities. There is a reason that Samuel the prophet was against it. And he, what he said about the kingship, the king will take and take and abuse and this and that, the history of the Jewish people in the book of Kings does not suggest he was wrong. Let's put it that way. We know that of the many abuses that people in power have. That's for sure. <coughs> so therefore, we have two parallel stories, but the important point about the parallels 
is that it doesn't mean they're identical. And in fact, I would say that's why the story of the succession of Shlomo in our tradition is put in the book of Kings and not in the book of Samuel. And the book of Samuel ends with the ideal kingship. The book of Kings is a pretty negative book. It's about how we ended up in exile. And um, yeah, so it's put in a different book. But fundamentally, what's parallel to the two stories is a story with two endings. So all these academics are not wrong that the book of the story of David ends properly in the second chapter of Kings. That is true. What they fail to grasp is it's a story with two endings. And actually, so was the Abraham story, a story with two endings. They are, they are similar, but not identical. That's the first point I wanted to make over here. Okay, what, what time is it now? Five minutes. Oh, I have five minutes. Oh, yeah, five minutes. Seven, 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 seven minutes. Okay, seven minutes. Okay, let me say the following. There's a lot more still here. I think next week we'll continue with this. There's a lot more still here. What's interesting is what I try to do in my teaching, sometimes it works, thank you, sometimes it doesn't, is this. You know, the idea is that there's the, the content. There's the trying to understand what is written here, which is very important. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, I think it's an honor to study this book. This is nothing that's unbelievable. But what I try to do is to try to show how we arrive at our conclusions, a, a mode of reading. And that is actually equally important because it's very important to see how the text actually expresses itself. When I say the text, there are different texts. Every, every book has its own soul. And you try to, it's like every, every book's like a person, you know? You try to understand the, the person. You try to understand what motivates them, try, what, what the deep underlying issues that they have, what they're about, what's special about them. And that's when you learn Torah, every book, every book has a neshama, actually. It's not always easy to, to, to figure it out. But they, they, each book is different. I want to say one thing about reading, which is, Related to the Megillah. The Megillah, let's talk five minutes. The Megillah, there's a dispute actually in the, both in the Gemara and the Medrash. Same dispute, Rav and Shmuel, Barachashverosh. One says, Melech Tipe Shaya. One says he's a fool. And the other one says, Melech Rasha. He's a wicked person. These are the two opinions. The I say the general drift, if we have a general drift within our tradition, is the more towards the latter, that he's a, that he's a, he's a, he's a wicked person. He may also be a tipesh, but he's a wicked person. So I was thinking that this question as to what, who Achashverosh is, a tipesh or a rasha, is actually very much related to the way you read the Megillah. And there's something about the Megillah that is different than any other book we have. I mean, there's several things that are different, but one in particular, a, a unique feature of the Megillah. There's been enormous interest in the last 50 or so years. I myself, close to 50 years ago, raised exactly this question about purposeful ambiguity. You read a text, and sometimes you can't figure out how to interpret it, not because of our inability to interpret, but sometimes because the text doesn't lend itself to a particular interpretation. The text is ambiguous. I started with that many years ago myself. Unbeknownst to me, at the very same time, other people, in particular this guy named Mayor Sternberg, was working on a book about how the biblical narratives work. Um, important book. He talked about the same thing, called it gapping. He talked about gap. The truth is that personally, over the years, I've retreated a lot from, I still believe it's true in certain occasions, but I think each case is different. You can't throw them all together. Each case has to be studied separately. But there's one place, one book, I think, and only one, where from beginning to end, it is truly ambiguous about how to understand the book. And that's the Megillah. Because the Megillah can be read. I and mean, let's forget anything we know. If you're walking in the street, you found this Megillah, right? It reads like a fairy tale, basically. It's, God is never mentioned explicitly, that's for sure. And it sounds like a court drama with a wise queen, a clever queen, at the last second saves the people and all that. And... It revolves around the fact that one night the king can't sleep and happens to see in the record books that Mordechai the Jew had saved his life, wasn't rewarded. At the very moment that Haman's walking into his chambers, who knows what time in the morning, to tell the king 
to have Mordechai executed prior to his meal, his lunch meal, you know? So the question is, when you read that, you say to yourself, what's this about? Is it, an, is it a, a kind of coincidence? Possible. It's, a set of co- it's random. Things happen randomly. That's what I call Mel Tipesh. Don't look, for, don't look for motives. Don't look for... Things just happen. They happen randomly. Where is God in all this? Very good question. But certainly one can read the book that way. It's so impossible to read it that way. The alternative reading is that no, things just don't happen. Everything makes sense on some level. And Achashverosh is not a fool. Everything can be explained logically in the Megillah from beginning to end. It's a book that lends itself to two readings, and they're equally plausible. Now, I'll give you one example of this, and there's so much more to say, but I'll just take three minutes to give you a simple example. In the Megillah, so there's a decree written against the Jews that all Jews are to be killed on the 13th day of Adar. That's tomorrow, actually, 13th day of Adar. All the Jews, men, women, children, that's it. In the interim, which is the 12th month, in the interim, Esther has interceded. She has convinced the king (coughs) that Haman is the real enemy. The Jews are his friends. Haman's the real enemy. The king executes Haman. Then Esther goes back to the king at that point, after Haman's been killed, executed. And she says to the king, to retract the, the letters. Esther doesn't want a war, by the way. She says, call off the war. Very important point. Call off the war. The king says, I can't do it. Why can't I do it? Well, the first, what's ever signed with the king's seal can't be retracted. What you can do, he says, if you wish, is to write a second letter which contradicts the first. So you say to yourself, if it's a Melech Tipeish, I understand it. Because what is the difference in effect between canceling, calling back the first decree? You can't do that you can't do, because it's sealed with the king. But you can issue a second decree which contradicts the first decree. Okay. But if he's, a, if he's a, not a Tipeish, he's a Russia, it means he's a clever character. So what is that about? How can you understand it? You can't, you can't bring it back, issue a second contradictory letter. But of course, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Because let's say, let's say you're Achashverosh. You are convinced, rightly or wrongly, that Haman was after your crown. And by the way, he could even be right that Haman was after his crown, but that's a separate conversation. It could be so. It's possible. And Haman has hired soldiers, who knows how many. We know he had 75,000 die. There's 100,000 soldiers, many of them in your capital city, your guy who wanted your crown. Let me ask you a question. Do you want these soldiers milling about your city? I don't think so. You want to get rid of them. On the other hand, you're a good Persian. You believe you're a, peace, a peacenik. You don't want to hurt the other Persians. How to get rid of 100,000 soldiers without you being responsible? Oh, it's simple how. Let the marginalized people do your dirty work for you. Then you can blame them. That's exactly the point. No, we can't call it off. But you know, the Jews can fight. And I support the Jews 100%. Right? I support the Jews 100%. So that's exactly what happens. There is a war. And after one day, the king says to Esther, how many have the Jews killed? Do you know how, many, yeah, how many did the Jews kill? Then the king says, you know what I'm going to let you do? Fight in Shushan a second day. Because Shushan is his city. The rest of the province is but his city. So therefore, he has used the Jews to eliminate his enemy. The same way Pharaoh uses Joseph to enslave the Egyptian people. Go to Joseph. Whatever he says to do, you should do. You know, Which is the, the way the king operates throughout the Megillah. So what is he? Is he a fool, or is he a very clever person? And it's totally immoral, but a clever person. And the fact of the matter is, through every step in the Megillah, you can plausibly read it both ways. So what hangs over the Megillah, I would say, when you read the Megillah, okay, any other book, is a sense of uncertainty. We don't actually know what the motivation is. And the idea of uncertainty is something which is central to, to, to the Megillah. It's what Mordechai says to Esther at the end of the great chapter 4 when he says, tells her to go, to, the, to, to go to the to the king. He says, go to the king and beg the king. He says, he says maybe, he says, um, odea. who knows, he says, maybe this is why you became the queen. Mi odea. As I said before, the deep, Rav Nachman said it, 
The deepest level of un- to know is to know you don't know, actually. Right. I, maybe the essence of life, really, that we don't actually, what do we actually know? We have the tree of knowledge. And the deepest knowledge, says Rav Nachman, is we understand that we don't really know. So the un- idea of uncertainty, anything is possible, you know what I mean? I mean, right now we're experiencing this, all of us. We have this virus. What do we know about this? What's going to be? Who knows? No one knows. I never, I never see anything like this in my life. We don't know. There are forces way beyond us. And we do the best we can with what we try to know. That's what we hear, is try to know. But we also understand much will always remain unknown. Right. Happy point. We'll see you next week. Thank you.